So welcome everybody. My name is Neil Johnson from uh, Cree, the Heart and Stroke Charity here in Ireland and from the Global Heart Hub. And you're all very welcome to the sixth in the Global Heart Hub series on patient advocacy, training and development. This is a long term uh, project of the Global Heart Hub. Um, this is a, a, a bi-monthly uh, session where we introduce you to um, various um, individuals who are going to share or are sharing with us their personal journeys in, in patient advocacy. And our objective over the coming months is to build up uh, to a boot camp, two day boot camp on advocacy training and development, which will hopefully happen uh, in uh, later this year in October. Um, the bi monthly series is brought to you uh, with very generous support from our industry sponsors Novartis, Pfeiffer Pharma, Boringer Ingelheim, and Servier. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I just want to say a few words of introduction uh, to the Global Heart Hub. Global Heart Hub is a relatively new uh, organization. It is an international alliance of heart patient organizations, uh, of currently of which we have uh, over 60 affiliates across the globe. And uh, the Heart Hub aims to provide a platform to unite heart patient organizations across the world. We aim to organize and amplify the patient and carer voice as stakeholders in healthcare systems and, of course, in their own personal healthcare. And one of our key aims and objectives is to build patient organization capacity and capability uh, for advocacy. We strongly believe that the patient voice in cardiovascular disease uh, is largely disorganized and underrepresented, and the Global Hub aims to address. Uh, those issues. And obviously, ultimately, the objective here is to contribute to improved self-care and self-management through patient empowerment. As I mentioned, this is the sixth um, session in our series, and we're absolutely delighted to be joined today by an internationally renowned uh, patient advocate and speaker, Dave de Bronckhart, who will be joining us in a few minutes live from Boston. He's widely known as ePatient Dave, a, a kidney cancer survivor who has become one of the world's leading advocates uh, for patient engagement, a well-known blogger, health policy advisor, international keynote speaker, and author of the highly rated Let, Pat Let ha Patients Help, a patient engagement handbook. Dave is a co-founder and chair emeritus of the Society for Participatory Medicine, in 2009, Health Leaders magazine listed both Dave and his doctor on their annual list of 20 people who make healthcare better. Dave's TED talk, Let Patients Help, went viral, reaching global audiences and with over half a million views in one of the most viewed TED talks of all time, subtitled in 26 languages, indicating the global appeal of his message. In 2012, the US National Library of Medicine announced that Dave's blog was being included in its History of Medicine division. And in 2015, Dave became a visiting professor in internal medicine at the famed Mayo Clinic. Just very quickly, in terms of housekeeping, this webinar uh, is recorded um, and uh, we're using the, uh, the uh, webinar mode, which means that you can view only However, we would encourage you to submit any questions, comments, or observations using the, using the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. We do encourage you to interact. The whole purpose of this exercise, it's a one hour of your time, and we hope you will gain as much as possible by asking, submitting, or listening to the question and answer sessions. And very importantly for us to improve future events, we value your feedback and request a few minutes of your time to complete a post-event questionnaire, which should arrive in your mailbox no later than uh, one day from today. And just want to finally say that views and comments expressed by anybody, uh, questioners or speakers during the recording are personal opinions and do not necessarily represent the views of the Global Heart Hub. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dave de Bronckhart. Uh, so Dave, if you can turn on your camera there, um, we look forward to seeing you and uh, hearing from you. And I think you're, you're un, unmuted there. So I'll disappear from the screen and hand over to you. And thank you again 
uh, for giving so generously of your time today. You know, it's a, it's a thrill to be talking to this audience. And I have to say, uh, it's, it's a little complicated sometimes, like right just this moment as you were inviting me to adjust my controls, uh, I was moving my mouse, but I was seeing your mouse moving on your screen. And <laughs> one of the lessons that I've learned, it was, as you'll hear in 2007, uh, I almost died. Uh, I recovered, and part of how I did that was by being, being an activated, involved patient. And you know what? A lot has changed in the last 14 years. And one of my lessons of life now is if you live long enough, things change. Because I just, I, that shouldn't be a surprise, but it's amazing how many people, especially in the medical professions, expect the world to be when they were the way it was when they were in medical school. And they got a legitimate, valid diploma and all of that. But we are in an era of rapid change. And our task as advocates is encouraging people to think and do things differently in a way that they can hear. Merely going to the gates of the castle and banging on the doors and throwing flaming arrows over the top won't create change. So having said that, Let's see now, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and all of you, by the way, are hosts who are more organized and disciplined thinkers uh, than I am, are welcome to drop me a note in the chat and say, Dave, it's time to do this or this so that we get things done and leave time for questions. So, patience of the future, what a bold concept. Uh, participatory medicine, the big fundamental challenge we have in this ongoing cultural conversation is uh, how do we encourage clinicians to view us as legitimate partners for participation when we don't have the medical education that they do? And stories, uh, several stories I hope in what I'll present are a powerful way of doing this. And there's also reasoning. The screen spotlights a few things I want to mention. There's the Society for Participatory Medicine, uh, the handshake symbol, which as you heard, I helped co-found. There's this book, Let Patients Help. The wording of that is important. It emphasizes that this is about collaboration, not about overthrow. Okay, uh, or as, as one person described it, it's not about flipping the tyranny so that we're the boss now, right? Uh, and this next book that I'm working on called Super Patients is a whole separate world. Um, I hope that book will get finished. So, uh, moving on. So, this is a, uh, a the cover of a magazine that reported on a talk I gave in Portugal a few years ago. Uh, we know the answer to this question for you. What will you do to change the world? You're working to make healthcare uh, work better. How I came to be here, it's a very unlikely story. I was just a guy working in high tech marketing in 2006. Uh, I was a, a data geek. You know, I like to follow tech trends and automation. In 2007, I discovered that I was almost dead and I got better in less than a year. True story, unusual, but true. In 2008, I started blogging about the e-patient movement. I'll explain that word in a moment. In 2009, we founded the Society for Participatory Medicine and I started asking to give speeches, which I had done in my career. And then things got crazy. Uh, in 2010, I started doing this full time. In 2011, 10 years ago this month, I did my TED talk in the Netherlands and started uh, speaking internationally. Then medical schools, advisory work and consulting, it's now approaching 700 events in 26 countries. Uh, it's been an unlikely trajectory. 
fundamental principle number one, as I said, if you live long enough, things change. Here is an example of what I'm talking about. Some of you may have heard of a famous US Supreme Court justice named Oliver Wendell Holmes. This was his father. And 150 years ago, here's what he taught medical students uh, in an address he gave at one of their graduation exercises. Your patient has no more right to all the things you know than he has to all the medicine in your saddlebags. He should get as much as as good for him and no more. Well, uh, I disagree. Uh, but on the other hand, it turns out what he was saying, remember this was 150 years ago, there was not much that a doctor could do to save a dreadfully sick person. And he was saying, if you know your patient is doomed, you have no right to burden them with that knowledge. Well, fast forward 100 years, this physician, Warner Slack, was a mentor of my personal care, my primary care physician. Uh, and he said, patients are the most underused resource in healthcare. Now, what's he talking about? Because I don't have the medical training, but how is it that we are underused? And this question, uh, asking a question of, how can this be true is how we open minds to a conversation about rethinking things. Fundamental principle number two, when assets digitize, things change fast, right? When information gets on the internet, when your phone contains your medical records, things can change fast. And number three, patients are the ultimate stakeholder in how things work out. This item here creates a logical space in which we can say, please listen to us. Now, this is important. Uh, I was a founding member of the BMJ's patient advisory panel, and a large part of the reason that they created, the editors created that panel, was the realization that they would go to medical conferences that were advertised as featuring all stakeholders. And there would be government people, there would be doctors, there would be scientists, there would be people from business, but no patients were actually being asked their opinion and spoken or speaking on stage. And yet they said all stakeholders. Well, the point that I make is that patients have more at stake than anyone else in how well care is conducted. And I don't just mean at the individual level, priorities for the entire health system ought to be adjusted for the benefit of the patient community. This good looking gentleman, Tom Ferguson here, conceived the concept of e-patients. He, when the internet was born, recognized that suddenly we had access to information that we had never had before, and we had the ability to reach other patients. Here we are living his vision 25 years later. He spotted these people at the top here around the internet doing things that had not been possible before. I'll point to two in particular. This is my primary physician, he has always, his name is Danny Sands, Dr. Danny Sands on social media. He has always believed in participatory thinking. And over here is a man who back before the web created a network of cancer listservs because his wife had metastatic breast cancer. Uh, and Ferguson coined this term he said they're equipped, engaged, empowered, enabled. I personally have never understood by why this word hasn't caught on, but as long as behavior and policy changes, that's enough for me. This is how Dr. Sands has always held the computer during an office visit. See, he turns it 
physicians have good right these days, clinicians, uh, to complain about the usability of metal, medical record systems. But that's no reason to turn away from the patient. Okay, when I look at the garbage that he has to go through with mouse clicks, I understand why he's under time pressure. And but you know what, with or without modern medical records computers, sometimes people make mistakes while they're typing into the computer, and I can spot it. Well, as you heard, he and I were among the co founders of the Society for Participatory Medicine in 2009. Now, if you're involved in a social movement, which we all are, uh, it's amazing when a magazine decides to publish about you, because this was not our public relations firm. We didn't have a public relations firm. But this magazine that goes to tens of thousands of American hospital executives talked to us and they decided to make it a cover story, literally in September, 2009, they called it the patient of the future. And they correctly identified that the difference here is a new relationship. Uh, sometimes in life, you don't realize what's happening. Well, they sent a photographer to visit some of us. And I just thought they would take a picture of my head the way is commonly done to put in the, the body of the text of an article, I would have worn a different shirt if I'd known they were gonna make me full page on the table of contents, oh my goodness. But in a way, look what's happening here. This magazine is saying that the patient of the future is a middle-aged guy with a bit of a belly in a tacky looking shirt and shorts, sitting at home, looking things up on the internet. Now remember, this was 12 years ago. I'm going to very briefly cover my story, well, briefly compared to how much I could say, right? I was going to visit Dr. Sands for the first time in several years in 2006, and I had a lot of things I wanted to talk about. So I sent him an email with my agenda. Some people say, oh, you sent your doctor an agenda? Dr. Sands actually says he's great, glad I did because he had things that he wanted to go over too. Uh, so it let him plan the appointment time. Now, some of them were simple things, just updates, didn't take up any time in the appointment. But I had one optical symptom that was strange and I'd never had before. I had a strange pattern happening in one eye and it would get bigger and then disappear. Uh, and rather than trying to explain it during the appointment, I Googled, it took me two hours to find something that matches and I pasted it in. You see how much faster we, we moved ahead on this. I gave him the URL, the same as you would with anybody else. Sure, this was back in 2006, but the web was 10 years old by then. I gave him all this information. Patient, people say patients should not diagnose themselves on the internet. That's correct in my opinion, but this was a page about ophthalmic migraine. So I pasted that in with a question mark. The key distinction here is I wasn't trying to be the doctor or play doctor. I was just trying to give him as much information as possible, the same as you would if you were meeting with any other expert in any other part of life. Another important thing that happened was I had an item where I had a stiff shoulder. Uh, it wasn't a sharp pain, but it, it was just stiff. And so we arranged for me to get an x-ray. That x-ray coincidentally saved my life. The next business day after the holidays, January 2nd, 2007, I had this x-ray and the morning, the next morning at 9 a.m., if you've ever had a moment of devastating diagnosis, you'll know what I mean. When that phone call came, he said, Dave, I called up the x-ray on my screen at home. Remember how things change? At the time, I wished I could look at it. Well, today we can screen share. And he could have shown me, but back then we couldn't. He said, Dave, your shoulder's going to be fine, but there's something in your lung. 
that shouldn't be there. That this was a total coincidence. Uh, and so he had me go in and get a CAT scan and that revealed that there were five of these in both lungs. That meant it surely was cancer that had spread from, some, from somewhere. I didn't have any symptoms, but I was about to be really sick. It turned out that an ultrasound revealed the primary tumor was in my kidney. It was kidney cancer. Now, the, one of life's quirks here, this is a generic diagram of my disease that happens to show tumors in every place where I had them. There's the one in, in the lung near that shoulder. My first pain was six weeks later when my legs started hurting. My, my femur eventually broke because the tumor was so large and I, I fell and landed on it. Uh, this shows a metastasis in the brain. Mine was actually in the skull right near there. And because I've always been an overachiever, I had these additional tumors, including if you look at the head again, there was a few weeks before my treatment started, a tumor erupted from my tongue. I had kidney cancer growing in my mouth. Thankfully, it was just a tiny bump. I didn't even know it was a tumor, but I was really sick. Some people don't wanna know how bad their odds are, but I do, and I looked, and my median survival was 24 weeks. Half the people as sick as me in that one study were dead in five and a half months. No horrible diagnosis is good, but the knowledge that there's a 50-50 chance you'll be dead in less than six months focuses the mind. Uh, I remember waking up in the middle of that night, looking at my ceiling in my bedroom, thinking, what am I doing sleeping? You know, uh, after the shock, several days later, I started thinking, okay, what are my options? What can I do? A pivotal moment. Now I understand some patient-centered care demands that we listen to what's important to the individual patient. We'll get to that later. But so, and some people want to be left alone, want to be taken care of. They don't want to be asked questions. But somebody like me is like, what can I do to help? An important moment was when Dr. Sands, remember Dr. Sands knew that guy who had started a network of cancer patient listservs way back before the web, because of Tom Ferguson, he knew this guy. And this is at the website. Now this no longer exists. It's become a company called Smart Patients. And he, he said to me, Dave, you're an online kind of guy. Uh, you might want to join this community. Well, bam, I went home and that night I was online. And in the first two hours, of my joining, my posting my first message there. I heard this is a bad disease, find a specialist hospital. There's no sure cure for it today. Today, there are far more treatments. If you live long enough, things change. But the uh, back then, there was this one thing called high dose interleukin that usually doesn't affect people at all but if it does, about half those people have a complete response. Voila, here I am, I'm one of the lucky ones. But they said, it sometimes kills people with the side effects. How's that for, anyway. And they said, um, let's see, don't let them give you anything else first. And here are four doctors in your area who do it and their phone numbers. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, I assert that from the point of view of the ultimate stakeholder, this is valuable information, but to this day, none of that exists in the medical literature. Now, isn't that interesting? It doesn't mean that the medical literature is wrong. It means that there's additional value to be harvested beyond the literature. In my case, so this is one of the early CAT scans. 
which in this showing one of the five tumors in my lungs, that one's the size of a golf ball. 50 weeks later, there it is. Immunotherapy, this interleukin, when it works, it's incredible. I only had surgery to remove the kidney. And of course, when my leg broke, all the other tumors just disappeared over the next two years, even after the treatment ended. Immunotherapy has such promise. So by the end of that year, I was like, whoa, that was a wild ride. So what do you do? I started a blog, all right? And then I learned about the e-patient community and a bunch of things happened. Now, here we get to the part about social change. As I started giving speeches around the world, the BMJ caught wind of what I was doing and they invited me to tell my story. And now this is important because it's not like I went banging on their doors, but they saw that there was something important to be learned from the fact that the e-patient community helped save my life. Now, what are they talking about? We'll get to that in just a moment. As a social change activist, when the BMJ invited me to publish something, right? I thought, okay, I want to influence doctors. Doctors are going to read this. And I asked my oncologist, what would you want other doctors to know about my case? And I quoted him. He said, you were really sick. I don't know if you could have tolerated enough medicine if you hadn't been so well prepared. Ladies and gentlemen, my oncologist saying that being engaged, informed and activated and involved, right, in his opinion, helped save my life. Quoting expert physicians is a powerful thing to do in a culture change conversation like this. Now, what was he talking about? Remember, the side effects can kill you. Well, I heard this, a passive person will choose to say, okay, I'm hope, I understand the risks. I hope I'm one of the lucky ones. I said, all right, so how do I prepare for these side effects? What are they and what do I do if one of them happens? And he said, here's culture change. That's an interesting question. Nobody's ever asked that. Here we are at one of the top hospitals in the world for this disease, and nobody has ever asked, how do I prepare for this experience? So having first checked with the physician community, I then turned to the patient community and said, you who've been through this, you may have had conversations like this yourself. You who've been through this, what was it like? What should I know? Uh, and I got 16 firsthand stories from people who'd been through it. And every time a side effect hit, some of them were minor and some of them were nasty. I did, I almost died during the treatment. My blood pressure crashed to 50 over 30 and they had to stop the treatment immediately but I survived. Uh, every time one of them hit, I had some idea what was happening, which was so different from imagining yourself being on the roller coaster ride from hell where you don't know what's gonna happen next. So I evangelized. Now here's a, an important scientific question. How can it be that the most useful life-saving information could exist outside of the literature where we're taught to look. I mean, even today, smart people are saying, listen to the scientists regarding COVID-19. And a lot of people are saying, I don't believe scientists. Well, how could this be? And the answer is big time. Knowledge is power and access has changed forever. We have in the world today, this is a social media diagram, but this is exactly like capillaries, right? The ungoverned network of connections where information nutrients, if you want to call it that, can travel without centralized control. It's important to express it this way because it makes it credible 
to a medically trained person that you might have a piece of information that their doctor hasn't seen. How is this possible? They don't have the education, they say. Well, we do have motivation. Believe me, we have motivation and focus. Dr. Sands likes to say, I'm trained in all of primary care medicine. He has something like 10,000 conditions but these were where he's required to know something. I had one disease where I was happy to go deep and, and you know, it wasn't like I would say, okay, I found this on the internet, who needs my doctor? I would bring it to my oncologist and say, I found this, what do you think? It's like I was being a hunting dog, you know, going out and finding something. And access to knowledge is empowering. Now I'm gonna show you a few super activated chronic e-patients today. First is my friend Sarah in Stockholm at Karolinska Institute. She has Parkinson's disease and she created this brilliant visualization, which we are all will, welcome to use. Each blue dot is one or each dot is one hour in the year. The red dot is the three 20 minute visits she has during the year with her neurologist. And she and her neurologist agree that it is, since she's the one, the only one there doing all of the blue dot hours, it's essential for them to improve her ability to self-manage, right? Their, their job is not to sit there and be smart and tell her what to do, but to improve her ability to run all the other hours of her life. This is my friend, Dane Lewis. She has type one diabetes and believe it or not, sitting on the desk there is her digital glucose meter, her digital insulin pump and a pocket computer that costs $35 that is running software that manages her insulin. They call it Open APS, Open Artificial Pancreas System, or DIY, Do-It-Yourself Pancreas System. Uh, Scott Librand is her, was her boyfriend, now her husband. And this is it. They, they created software that reads, the, he's a programmer, she is the patient. And he, she advised him on what she wanted more of and less of. Uh, and they created this. There are over a thousand people now in the world uh, using this system. It's a do-it-yourself electronic pancreas. Uh, and you know why they did this? Their hashtag was, we are not waiting. Decade after decade, industry said to them, we are... Uh, we're working on it. We will get you an artificial pancreas. Remember that fundamental principle. When assets digitize, things change fast. They finally said, we're not waiting. And they did it themselves. So consider this. On the top row here, this is one of Dana's slides that she gave me to use. This is what the blood sugar level looks like for most people with diabetes. And look at it, running that open source software that they created, they are all within range around the clock. The most heart touching story of this for me is a man whose newborn baby was found to have type one diabetes. Can you imagine putting a baby in the crib overnight? I get emotional, hoping that you did everything right and the baby will be fine in the morning. Well, now the computer is managing it. And not only is the baby fine in the morning, but you have data, right? Isn't that empowering as well as inspiring? So anyway, and they're out there tweeting. You can go look at the open APS hashtag and the um, one of Dana's slides about the power of every innovation being driven by patients is the typical process for inventing an auto is you go through all these things and there's no car that's for ready for people to use, where when patients do something like this, they started with a very simple piece of software that wasn't that great, but it was satisfying. 
It's like a skateboard. And then they added things and added things and all the way through, it was what they wanted. And to move into cardiology, I would just a quick look at my friend Hugo, who is in the San Francisco area. He has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It took me three years to learn to say that. He has an implanted defibrillator in his chest. Every night when he goes to bed, this device transmits data to a bedside box so they can see what's happening in his heart. But you know what? It only sends the data to his doctor. The man he wants to know during the day, he'd like to look at his phone and say, what's happening in my heart? The manufacturer says, no, it's none of your business. This device belongs to your doctor. I disagree once again. Hugo's point, quoting in the fine print, Tom Ferguson, is that our interactions with the system are only the tip of the iceberg. Self-care is where the great majority of it all happens. Well, Hugo got a wonderful device. Uh, I'll, I'll pop ahead. It's, it's called an Alive Core. Some of you may know of it. Uh, this is an early model, it's smaller now. It attaches to a smartphone. The company now is, has been very successful. It's called Cardia with a K. Uh, and you put your two fingers on those electrodes uh, and it gives you an EKG, an electrocardiogram, uh, right then and there on your phone. And with one episode that he had, he went to A&E, he went to the emergency room and found that what had been read by the app and the, the smartphone EKG uh, matches what the ICD, what the implanted defibrillator says. So it's not clinical, it's not something you would use if you were in an operating room, but it is good enough to empower him to know what's going on in his heart. Knowledge is power, not to mention that it, you know, sort of relieves tension. So to get into some definitions before we move to questions, um, empowerment, and this is reflected in the Global Heart Hub slides at the beginning, but I'm I don't work as a scientist, I don't work as a social change employee in a big nonprofit organization, uh, but I'm college educated and I like to have formal definitions. Here is a definition that I learned at a Parkinson's conference. Increasing the capacity of individuals or groups to make choices, and of course, all these slides will be available afterwards, to make choices about what they want and transform them into actions and outcomes. Empowerment, giving people power, is increasing their capacity to make obviously informed choices and get results. That's it, plain and simple. Get results about what's important to them. And this definition has been used for nearly 20 years now by the World Bank. Now, I said this is a social movement we're talking about here. The World Bank has nothing to do with patient advocacy per se, but this is a universal social principle. They have another phrase on their website that I love that directly relevant to us, take a look at it. An empowering approach to participation treats poor people as co-producers with authority and control down at the lowest appropriate level. Now, in medicine, this means we wouldn't be expecting an empowered patient to be calling the shots on what to cut with a scalpel during surgery, right? But authority and control at the lowest level. Look what happens if you change poor people to patients. An empowering approach to participation treats patients as co-producers with authority and control at the lowest appropriate level. That is a paradigm change for patient experience, empowerment, and engagement. Uh, and there's one 
excellent trick that uh, I want to, this is from a larger speech I gave about the general issues of participation and empowerment. Uh, there is a model called Arnstein's Ladder, don't worry about that, but it talks about the levels of public participation in government. And at the lowest level, uh, the government merely tells people, this is what we're doing. Shut up if you have objections. Uh, and at the next level, the government says, what do you think about what we're doing? We're going to do it anyway, but what do you think? And at the third level up, I mean, this is a little bit of an improvement, but not much. See, it's all about power, right? Because here, all the power is still in the people in government or the, the managers at your company, whatever it might be, right? And then at the third level, you actually get some involvement. And I'm going to show you what a profound difference this can make to make the whole system run more smoothly, right? This is a sidewalk, a real world photo, a sidewalk created by brilliant engineers and architects of outdoor spaces, right? And these are people with lots of training. They know what they're doing. Um, once they opened the park, look what happened. It turns out people actually just wanted to go from here to there and they ignored what the designers did. Uh, and so, you know, if the patient, if the consumer, the, the citizen had been involved, they might have uh, said, let's build a path over here as well. For this reason, my doctor, Danny Sands, wears a button in clinic. What matters to you? He actually, and he makes a point of asking people what's important to them in their treatment options. Uh, there is no way for any software algorithm to answer this correctly in your case, because you might have considerations that no one else in the world has. An example is that a member of my kidney patient community a few years later had a bad relapse. There were new treatments available that hadn't been available before, which one to choose? Well, the most important factor to him was that his wife had also just gotten a cancer diagnosis. He was going to be her primary carer. And so the most important thing to him in his choice was maintaining his own energy level, All right? If we consult with what's important to the consumer, the patient, the affected person, we will surely have a better chance of making the whole system be more effective as defined by the sick person. So how do you do this? My incantation is I will say to every new doctor, and I did this just this past winter because I developed a new eye condition, I say, I'm the kind of patient who likes to understand as much as I can. See, that's a, see how this resembles introducing yourself to a new business associate or anything else? And I say, do you mind if I ask questions? Now, in a small percentage of cases, a physician uh, might say, I really don't like internet patients. I'll do the thinking and so on. And you may want to find another physician uh, if you have the freedom to do that. But even if you don't, at least you know who you're dealing with and that you'll be on your own. Um, I'm gonna close with one more cardiology case. Imagine this, it's one thing to be an informed patient. Well, what if like Dana Lewis, you invent a new remedy for your condition? That's what happened with this Englishman uh, uh, a boiler and factory engineer named Tal Goldsworthy. He has Marfan syndrome. So aortic dissection is a lifelong threat. Uh, and the, the problem is the wall of the aorta is weak. And he, this is from his TED talk, he thought, you know, in my industry, if something is weak, uh, we don't cut it out uh, and replace it if we don't have to, we just wrap it with something. See, the standard treatment for this for Marfan patients is 
to completely cut out the aorta. It's drastic surgery, obviously. Uh, and, uh, and then after you put in the, pla the plastic replacement aorta, you have to have spend a lifetime on blood thinners. And he thought, uh, he uses very colorful language, I can assure you. Uh, he said something equivalent to, I don't want to do that. Uh, and so he proposed, they took the computer images of his beating heart, this is an animation, and exported that, the shape of his aorta into some CAD CAM software and 3D printed a replacement, a, not a replacement, a wrapper for his aorta. So the doctor cut him open, wrapped this around and just sewed him back up. The operation was three times faster and he has been fine. And now they've made a product out of this. Uh, it's a surgery that's been done hundreds of times around the world. Uh, he figured out the idea and worked with his surgeons. Now, mind you, most of the doctors they talked to didn't want to have anything to do with it. This isn't in the scientific literature. Doctors didn't invent it. So let's empower patients who really want to do some of the work. Be an agent for change. Um, we could go on. Maybe I'll be able to come back during the boot camp, but th that's the, the starting picture. So shall we move to questions and answers? Absolutely. And Dave, thank you so much. Um, very insightful. And you've raised um, and touched a lot of very interesting topics. Um, in the interest of time, I've, I'm, I'm trying to group some of the questions and um, we will try and have to keep your answers as short as possible so that we can try and get through as many questions as possible. One sort of picks up on the last point there. You were making the analogy uh, of the sort of consumer relationship um, with the doctor patient relationship. And one question is, why is it that the, the patient relationship with a doctor is so different to other business type relationships, let's say when you engage an engineer or you engage a lawyer or you engage even in the paramedical areas, an optician or a dentist, why, why is it that um, there is this um, different dynamic? Do you, do you have any quick thoughts on that? And how do you, how do you change the dynamic for the better? This, well, so this, this may be a good subject for the boot camp if you want to get into the deeper why of how we got to this situation. The short answer, is that in the last 100, 150 years, real magic has become real, uh, has come to life in medicine. Back when that Oliver Wendell Holmes spoke, once you knew somebody had cancer, it was doomed. There was nothing that could be done. And then through the 20th century, we went through a period where the only way that you could do anything useful in major medical problems was to be an MD. Nobody else had access to any of the information or network of experts. That is no longer true. So that's the short answer why that one field is different from every other one. Yeah, and I think of course, it's, it's uh, one of the aspirations of the patient advocacy movement that we do create a different uh, dynamic and different engagement. There was a question in from Paul and it's, it's sort of uh, a playing on the e-patient um, which you described and, and Paul highlights that, you know, we should be thinking of e as the employer, which goes to the same dynamic that I described that the relationship could be more of a consumer. And as you rightly pointed out, um, you know, in the consumer dynamic, if you say to your doctor, uh, I'm the sort of guy who likes to ask questions. Uh, if the doctor um, is not up for that, then you, theoretically you have the choice. Now, very often it doesn't happen that way, but at least the patient should be empowered enough to, to, um, uh, to, to have that conversation. So Heather says, Dave, you have a fantastic personality, which has no doubt assisted in speaking with providers. How do you recommend patients discuss what they want with providers without si sounding like they're trying to take over their care? Many providers feel that the patient does not have the years and years of education. So the same thing again, it's that dynamic. So do you have a, a, a quick comment for Heather on that? Well, so I'm, I'm gonna strongly recommend that during the boot camp, you structure some role play sessions 
some some training to develop these skills. Uh, the the short answer is to be clear in expressing. Uh, and I said this with my new eye doctor. I said, I don't think I'm a doctor. I don't know anything about this subject at all, but I like to be involved and understand what I can. You know? uh, and the, in my experience, there are some arrogant jerks, but there are a small number. And one thing, time is on our side because you know, frankly, somebody who came out of medical school in the previous decade, is not likely to be that archaic. And the older doctors keep retiring. So time is on our side. And in the meantime, the most important thing for an advocate to do is be clear about what the truth is. Yeah, and it goes back to your point about, um, you know, uh, time changes everything and, and, and time is changing and we're moving into a digital world now. So. It, it, there is a, there is potentially a different um, relationship on the horizon, but obviously we need to 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 push that forward from a patient perspective. And again, a, a related question, and this comes in from Thomas. Um, he says, "Thanks for this excellent excellent talk. Awesome question. Can we and how can we um, use your approach to reverse educate physicians uh, and pharma industry by patients?" Any thoughts on that? How can we? How can how can the patient become the educator, basically? You mean about the relationship? In or, in the whole in the whole dynamic of the patient doctor relationship, that the the yeah. sort of traditional is doctor knows best, and without uh, um, you know being right. perceived as 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 you know trying to usurp the the the, the knowledge or, or or status of the doctor. How can you? How can how can patients participate? Um, in, in that reverse education, because so at the end of the day, the, the lived experience is the greatest experience, isn't it? And, and it doesn't replace the medical education, you know? Yeah. So I think the answer here, is, uh, and the Global Heart Hub might want to do something about this. Dr. Sands and I have done a number of lectures, shared lectures, keynote speeches, um, and don't tell anyone, but at the, what we actually do is we role play amid the lecture, we role play the uh, two actual visits during my case and use them to develop these teachable moments, uh, teachable principles. One of them is that there is too much information now for any doctor to know everything. Right, and this is a, this is where the point comes in about he has to know a lot, and I have the ability. It's entirely feasible now for me to find a paper that he hasn't seen. It doesn't mean that the paper is good, right, and so on. But if we view it, Dr. Sands, when he speaks, has a picture. I don't know. You know what a seesaw is? I don't yep. know if words. Yep. Oh, he has a picture, a slide of a picture where all the burden is carried by the physician to know everything and yep. nothing will go better than the extent of what's in his or her head. And he prefers the more level sharing of the load. Yep. So, but the, you, there are videos of that, of that shared speech that we've done. Uh, there's my book, uh, Let Patients Help. There's, uh, uh, there are resources uh, that you can use to, and you may want to take some of these things and turn them into training modules that are available through your website. Yeah, and I think there's great scope um, for patient engagement in actual medical education in this regard, because I think the doctor of the future mm -hmm. is going to have to be a different uh, type of uh, doctor. Um, as Colin says, a 15-year-old patient once characterized his doctor-patient relationship as, he is my doctor, I am not his patient, which I thought is, uh, is, <laughs> is quite interesting. Um, I, Phil says, um, I'm working closely with Heart Valve Voice. This is a, um, a patient organization working in the valve disease area to raise awareness of heart valve disease. I've done a blog, vlog, been on TV and radio last week to help the Just Treat Us campaign. This is a campaign that's been run globally by the Global Heart Hub, actually. 
Um, I've had a Zoom call with my local MEP, um, or sorry, I have a Zoom call with my local uh, uh, MP later this week to see what, uh, what we can do. What else can I do? Who else can I speak to? He's really looking here for, I guess, some um, advocacy direction um, around the reality, which is that um, due to COVID, there is such a backlog now of um, you know, waiting lists and postponed procedures and so forth heart patients and heart valve disease patients in particular because they have been um, most disenfranchised the evidence suggests um, what can they do to to advocate for um, you know being seen and and um, having their procedures this is sort of a practical question i don't know if you have any particular thoughts on that i have not gotten into that level yeah. uh, of things other than i so you may be a pioneer at an edge of this work uh, well beyond me at the moment, I assume. It sounds like you're actively involved with your local health system and perhaps even at a higher level, uh, which is perfect. Uh, if not, that's what you want to learn how to do. Yeah. Um, and that's the sort of skill that we hope to impart through the ongoing um, uh, advocacy training, and in particular in the boot camp. Uh, John says, with doctors' appointments often being short and rushed, doctors are under time pressures. Um, what can an engaged patient do uh, to convince doctors to slow down and answer the question? So in other words, how can a patient make the best use of what is very often a 10 to 15 minute consult? I'm well aware. I'm well aware. I actually, this new eye doctor said to me in the middle of March, just a few weeks ago, when he got through my first, when my diagnosis was new, uh, I had seven questions for him at the end of the visit. And he said, I'll go through this list with you now, but it is not my role to give you a PhD in our field. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Not quite well, the answer. Not quite the answer you're looking for. Well, so what I did was I went home and I wrote him a letter. I kept it as short as I could, saying, "Here's what happened." And this through the you have patient portals where you can send a message to your. Uh, 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 in some countries, unfortunately, not in ours. <laughs> yeah. Well, so maybe it's a paper letter, but I said, "Here's my situation. Here's what I thought. What should we do?" Um, and we actually, we worked it out. We had a relationship conversation, the same yeah. as if you had a relationship problem anywhere else. I made clear that I know they're under time pressure, you know, but then in the context of, I want to understand what I can, I asked, how can we manage the time in our visits better? Yeah, I think your example of sending the agenda for the for the consult is very interesting in many respects. One, it, it demonstrates that you are actually taking control of that consultation. You're going in with a preset questions. Now, maybe all uh, many doctors wouldn't take so kindly to receiving an agenda for their consult. However, the principle I think is important, which is that you go prepared. And this is something we constantly talk about, particularly now, um, a, you know, in the COVID environment where getting an appointment is perhaps even a more mm -hmm. challenging um, situation that patients actually, you know, sit down and record the questions that they, they need to ask. I think that's very important. Yes. Um, the um, norm um, says, excellent presentation. Can you kindly discuss the value of patient-centric groups such as the Global Heart Hub and its partners work more closely with physician professional societies and advocating for mutually shared goals. Um, Norm, it's a big long question, but I think I'm getting from it is the value, I guess, of working. Yeah, there is a there is a disconnect, if, I, if I'm representing Norm correctly here, there's a disconnect between uh, the patient movement and clinical mm -hmm. societies. Uh, in general, um, and we certainly have experienced this, clinical societies are not that keen to formally engage with patient groups. Can we do anything about that? Well, yes. I mean, keep having conversations, all right? My current work with the, you're, you're onto a brilliant idea. I know we're short on time, but if Maeve will remind me, I'll send out something. On our Society for Participatory Medicine website, we have a manifesto that we have just created, or it's signthemanifesto.org. 
is a short, uh, is a friendly link to it, that talks about this, it's five areas where the, the patient and the clinician can have uh, corresponding agreements. Uh, and it's a good idea to find somebody, somebody inside the clinician organization to have the, start having these conversations with. You know, 100 years ago, 110 years ago in the United States, women's suffrage was on the ballot. And most women were not asking for the vote. And the anti-suffrage group said, look, why should we complicate things? Most women aren't asking for this, right? But over time, uh, things progress. Culture change, exists in a shift in conversations. Yep. My current work with Pocket Health happened when I gave a talk exactly like this at a radiology conference and a bunch of radiologists said, whoa, we've really got to start empowering people through access to their records. Yeah, uh, so, so, so true. And I'm, I'm really disappointed that we've run out of time. Um, my screen is lighting up with questions. I am going to take you up on that offer of perhaps engaging with you f uh, later on in the year when we have our boot camp. A date yet to be determined. There's some questions in about that, but it will most likely be in October. But it is really what the Global Heart Hub is about. It's about trying to st start that, um, that, that culture change, or as you talk about that social movement um, which is which is patient advocacy. I'll leave you with a comment, which I got a giggle from here. It's from uh, Louis. He says, the main difference between God and a doctor is that God knows he's not a doctor. Well, I'm not, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that we're, we're, we're necessarily all taking that position, but there's a, there's a stream of, of very interesting letter, uh, questions here. Um, perhaps we will try and- because Maybe I can res respond to some that's what, Exactly, that's what I was going to suggest, that perhaps we could um, agree a blog um, and post a blog afterwards where you might look at some of these because there, there are really interesting questions here. Um, we, 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 we're trying desperately to keep this session to one hour so that uh, we don't lose people's interest. And I'm delighted to see we have still a very uh, high number of people um, with us today, Dave. It's been an absolute pleasure meeting you. Um, you've touched so many areas that are so important to us in the cardiovascular community. As I say, we definitely will uh, look forward to having a conversation with you again. I hope those who joined us today have got some benefit. Um, if nothing else, it certainly exposed people to some of the concepts and ideas um, that are in this world that we're, 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 we're now all working in, patient advocacy, patient empowerment, patient engagement. Thank you, Dave. May continued leave, good health and continued success in what you do. May I leave you with one quote also? So th this is from Max Planck, who some of you may know was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. He discovered quantum mechanics, which has set the stage for Einstein and all kinds of things. And even though he got a Nobel Prize, he still faced resistance from other scientists in his field who knew that he was wrong in their opinion. Uh, and these were learned scientists. And at the end of his career, he, in his scientific autobiography, he said this wonderful thing, a new scientific truth does not win acceptance by convincing but its opponents and winning them over. It wins acceptance because its opponents eventually die. <laughs> and a new, a new generation comes up that's familiar with the new truth. Yeah, so. well, that, 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 that's hopefully where we're going as to the new truth and the new, um, the new power that, that, uh, that uh, patients can have in terms of uh, the direction of their own healthcare. Dave, thank you again. And thank you to everybody who has joined us today, particularly all of you who've um, put some questions and comments up there. And um, this, this um, recording will be posted on the Global Heart Hub website, uh, hopefully within the next 48 hours. And we'll speak to Dave separately about perhaps a blog um, with uh, a follow-up to the unanswered questions from today. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye. More to you. Thank you.